Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Lecture 5.1, uh, Interaction. Uh, we'll be talking about the socialization process, status and roles, and emotions and personality. Effectively, what we're talking about here is how we interact with other human beings. Part of this conversation is uh, the nature versus nurture debate, which you may be somewhat familiar with as college students. This is really the stuff of college. The way this debate goes, or the questions at the center of it is, are we the people that we are because of our genetics or because of our socialization? This debate asks which factor determines individuals, behaviors, and traits. Ultimately, both nature and nurture do play a role in making us the people that we are. However, uh, sociological theory uh, typically sides with the nurture side of it. Sociological theory emphasizes that we are who we are because of um, the, our social interactions and, um, and our environments, our social environments in the world. Uh, that is not to say that uh, some genetic components such as uh, generalized anxiety, such as things like schizophrenia, things like depression, that those don't also impact our behavior, but most of what impacts our behavior from a sociological standpoint is seen as being uh, the stuff that uh, we have interacted with up to this point. And that socialization is that stuff. Socialization is the process of learning and internalizing the values, beliefs, and norms of our given social group. The socialization process begins in infancy and lasts throughout the life course or our lifetimes. Uh, I emphasize that because early sociological theory, uh, namely uh, sociological theory by George Herbert Mead, tended to um, de-emphasize uh, socialization that occurred after childhood and really focus on childhood socialization. But it is critical to import to remember that socialization continues through the life course. Additionally, language facilitates socialization. And if your language is somehow inhibited, uh, if you have hearing problems, if you uh, are unable to speak, if you're unable to understand language, then your socialization uh, will be different than that of somebody else. The socialization process constructs a sense of who we are how we think, and how we act as members of a given culture. It is our primary way of reproducing norms and cultural values. We reproduce our culture via the socialization process. Um, that's how it happens. That's how society continues from one generation to the next, is that we teach people basically how it works. We teach our children, we teach young people, we teach each other. The principal agents of socialization exert major influences over uh, us as individuals. So those agents of socialization are parents, teachers, religious institutions, peers, television, social media, uh, and others as well. The self is uh, our personal identity that is separate and different from all other people. So who you think that you are, your uh, perception of your you-ness, that is your self. Sociologists believe that the self is created and modified through interactions in our lives. And we do share this concept with uh, psychologists. Uh, Sigmund Freud, who was a notable psychologist in the early uh, 1900s, is usually associated with the school of psychoanalysis within uh, psychology, but his theories have helped sociologists gain a better understanding of social behavior. Uh, much of what Freud had to say has been discredited and debunked, but he did lay the groundwork for some of the very earliest stuff. Freud developed uh, a very important idea, uh, n these ideas of the subconscious and unconscious mind. I'm not going to ask you to know the difference between the subconscious and unconscious mind, as you might in a psych class, but just know that these subconscious and unconscious mind components of our brains are what drives 
our impulses, our thoughts, and our behaviors. Uh, effectively, what Freud is saying here is that there is stuff going on in your head that you are not aware of and do not actively have control over. Um, that is probably Freud's most active uh, contribution to the field of sociology is by acknowledging that stuff, uh, that component of uh, human behavior that we really just don't think about all the time. Charles Cooley believed that one's sense of self depended on seeing oneself reflected in the interactions with others. He called this the looking glass self. It refers to the notion that self develops through our perception of others, evaluations, and appraisals of us. Uh, that term looking glass self is supposed to be really descriptive, but it's so old fashioned it's not really useful anymore. Remember, looking glass is an old fashioned word for mirror. So think of it as the mirror self, right? You have your sense of self. You go out into the world every day and you project that sense of self. That projection bounces off of others acting as a mirror. And the way that others treat you, if they're nice to you, they smile at you, they spit at you, they yell at you, however they treat you is a reflection reflects back to you and back into your brain on whether you were your good self today or your bad self today. Probably, I don't know your individual psyche, if people treated you well, you think, well, you're a good person, you're a likable person, and you'll keep uh, behaving the same way throughout your day, right? But the, the key to Cooley's ideas here are that we interact with society and the way society treats us uh, determines uh, our self-concept. Cooley's looking glass self, I, I went over that, sorry, this is a typo, uh, but it um, also is directly related to ideas of primary groups, secondary groups, and reference groups. Primary groups are our families and our friends, these are people that we think are very, very important to us. So if our families and friends treat us uh, in a way, their opinion of us is much more important. Secondary groups, on the other hand, are groups like school or workplace. These are groups that we don't maybe necessarily how they think about us or we don't necessarily love these people, but we work with them and we interact with them in a way uh, to complete a job. So... I, I know my mother thinks I'm intelligent, but it's not super important to me that my mother thinks I'm intelligent or a hard worker. It is important that my colleagues and my students think I am that way, though. So, I, um, th they, I re they reflect on me, onto my sense of self, a little bit different than my family and my friends do, right? Both primary groups and secondary groups, they interact with me in a looking glass self way that are a little bit different. And either primary or secondary can be reference groups. Reference groups provide standards for judging our attitudes and behaviors. So any group that we think, well, what do these people think about me? Those are reference groups. Those are effectively your mirrors within the looking glass self. George Herbert Mead, as I mentioned, expanded Cooley's ideas. Mead also believed that the self was created through social interaction and that process started in childhood. As I mentioned, so much emphasis of Meads was put on childhood, and he really did help us understand childhood to such a great degree that uh, social scientists kind of got hung up on childhood for about 50 years. Uh, but it is important to emphasize that socialization is very important in childhood, but does also continue into adulthood. Mead has four stages of socialization. The preparatory phase, which are ages zero to three, are very self-centered. And in this phase, the human being basically is coming online, is turning on, is figuring out how their hands work, how to walk, that if you smile at someone, that they will smile back to you, uh, how basic language works, etc. The play stage then are ages three to four. And if you have children or if you have interactions with children, you will almost immediately be thinking, well, no kids do something and stop exactly at three or exactly at six or whatever. You're right. These ages are approximate. 
The play stages are ages three to four. In this stage, uh, children take on the attitudes and roles of significant others, i.e. people that are very important to them, such as their parents or their siblings. So the child will play uh, daddy or play sibling or play mailman or something like that. And then within the game stage, uh, the child from about six to five to six takes on roles of multiple others, being aware of social positions and perspectives. In the game stage, children become capable of complex thought and anticipating what other people will do in reaction to what they do. This is why kids start doing uh, team sports around the age of five and six. And the difference between a four-year-old uh, soccer team and a five-year-old soccer team is night and day because the, the players of the four-year-old soccer team think everyone has to run and go get that ball, right? But the six-year-old soccer player understands that if they are passed to from some other spot in the field, then the whole team can do it. And that's really important for, um, you know, the human species. Uh, that's how we learned how to hunt and take advantage of uh, our environment prior to the modern era. And then the adult stage in which we develop senses of generalized other and senses of society's norms and values. We uh, grow up, if it were. We think beyond ourselves and we think about what is best for society. Uh, that is uh, the adult stage, which is often ignored uh, when we talk about Mead social theory. The acquisition of language skills coincides with the growth of mental capacities. Uh, thus, uh, as children learn how to speak, their, um, their mental capacities uh, take off. And it's kind of hard for us to establish which is the independent variable and which is the dependent variable here. We're not sure whether the child's brain really taking off makes them able to speak or their capacity to learn how to speak is what uh, makes their brain take off. Um, that's, that's not really something we've gotten to the bottom of. And I'm not sure if we really can uh, as social scientists. Irvin Goffman, just a review, we have talked about Goffman in the past, believed that meaning is constructed via social interaction. Goffman saw social life as a sort of game in which we work to control impressions that others have over us, and he called this impression management. W.I. Thomas stated that if people define their situations as real, they are real in their consequences. And this is another one of those very profound things in the social sciences. This is called the Thomas Theorem. And think about that. If we define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. We encounter situations every single day that are um, ambiguous. We have to decide what is real, what isn't real, what's important, what's not important. Once I was um, biking after dark in a pretty bad neighborhood. And this is absolutely true. Uh, and it astounds me sometimes. Uh, I was biking in a pretty rough neighborhood. I stopped at a stoplight like a law-abiding citizen. And a voice from the darkness yelled at me, Hey, I like your bike. Well, I wasn't thinking, hey, I'm in a tough neighborhood. I was just thinking, I'm riding my bike, right? And that guy clearly wanted me to give me his bike give me give him my bike right he, he's trying to steal my bike my response was well thanks <laughs> and i just kept i i started riding my bike again i did not define that situation as dangerous it could have been dangerous he might have pulled a gun on me but that's not how i define the situation and thus you know i still have that bike uh even though it might not necessarily have been the smartest thing to do in the world um and, and there are so many examples of that i, I could talk for a while about uh, Thomas theorem um, it is one of really the more interesting uh, components of sociology to me at least quite frankly now let's talk about statuses and roles a status is a position in society that comes with a set of expectations we have ascribed statuses and achieved statuses 
An ascribed status is one that we are born with and is unlikely to change. An example of an ascribed status is race. Uh, your race, um, you can do things to mask it, but uh, it isn't it is isn't going to change or is incredibly difficult to change. Right? You have to take strenuous measures to try to get past or get perceived to be a different way. Achieve status, then, is one that we have earned through individual effort or is, it impo is imposed by others on us. So we did something to get an achieve status. You applied for a job and you got the job. You applied for college and you got to college. You committed a crime and you got put in prison, right? That is also an achieve status. It's not necessarily good things. A master status, then, is a status that seems to override all other statuses and affect the other statuses that we possess. Uh, this varies from individual to individual. One example I use is what I call the doctor baby uh, example. Uh, if you were very sick, if you had strep throat or you had a really bad flu or you felt real sick and you're sitting in a doctor's office and they said the doctor will be with you shortly. And then in comes in a two-year-old, barely able to walk. Uh, and this is Dr. Baby, right? Even if Dr. Baby went to Harvard Medical School, even if Dr. Baby did a residency at Johns Hopkins, right? You would not trust Dr. Baby because Dr. Baby's master status is that of baby, right? Even if Dr. Baby was somehow magically the greatest doctor ever. And that's a silly example, but it gets the point across. My friend Aliyah here in the middle, she is a child care worker. She is a person with her master's degree. Uh, she is an educator. But the status she's most frequently perceived as is that of being a Muslim woman. Right? Uh, and so that is the status that overrides other status because that's how people perceive her. And... When I use my friends in my examples, I ask them if it's okay. And she said, yeah, but is that necessarily a bad thing? Uh, that That's my master status? I said, no, not inherently. It depends on what the person thinks of a Muslim woman. Um, it, could be, it could be a positive thing. Now, with that said, if you are going to be discriminated against for some reason, uh, it is probably going to be your master status. Um, so that's, that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, President Obama was a really good example of, he continues to be, of a person uh, with a master status, um, a real powerful master status, that of being an African-American male. Before he was a presidential candidate, um, the position of African-American male uh, is so heavy with discrimination that I am sure there are people that he interacted with in society that treated him different from other people because he was an African-American male. And it was not until he was elected president that people started treating him um, up and beyond that master status, at least most people. Some people still hold those racist attitudes and opinions. Um, but yeah, that's a really... All the very interesting concept. So your master status could be what you're going to be discriminated against for, but it isn't inherently a bad thing. All statuses are associated with roles. Roles are behaviors expected from a particular status. So I am a teacher. That is my status. I grade papers. I am a father. That is my status. I care for children. Caring for children is the role of a modern father. We can respond, and there are some problems that can occur with roles. Two of those are role conflict and role strain. Role conflict occurs when the roles associated with one status clash with roles associated with a different status. A sick child makes it tough for a teacher who is a father to grade papers. So the sick child, the status of father is getting in the way of the status of teacher. And those two things are conflicting. That's called role conflict. 
role strain occurs when roles associated with a single status clash. I, as a parent, feed children, but when I am trying to make dinner, they can make it really tough to make dinner. They, they need attention one way or another. They want to play, they, they run, they scream, whatever, right? So the pressure, think of it almost like a bridge that's under strain, right? The forces within the bridge uh, building, that is role strain for the status of being a parent. Either of these positions may lead to role exit. Either role conflict or role strain may lead to role exit. Uh, people often leave jobs, for example, because they interfere with their family life. That is an example of role conflict uh, creating role exit. Or you may leave a job because you have to complete certain uh, computer work to do the job, but you also... Um, have to keep your boss happy and you also have to uh, oversee other people who are under you and you can't do all of those things that would be role strain creating role exit. let's talk a bit about emotions and personality we tend to believe that our emotions are highly personal and individual we tend to believe that we're happy because we're happy or that our emotions are in our brain or our social being or whatever. The reality of the matter is that certain social settings and social patterns have emotional responses. Thus, if you're at a funeral, even for a funeral of someone you don't really know, you're likely to feel sad. If you go to a concert or a comedy show or a movie or whatever, you're likely to feel happy or excited. If you are in class, uh, you hopefully are paying attention, but you may also feel bored by that class, right? Because it is eliciting a uh, certain um, a certain emotion, right? It, it's it's an emotion of studiousness at the very least. It probably isn't uh, something entirely different. It probably isn't like something like depression. It hopefully not. It probably isn't something like arousal or. Uh, rage, right? Those are emotions that we want to try to keep under grasp in teaching that are less likely to happen. Finally, emotion work refers to the process of evoking, suppressing, or managing feelings to create a public display of emotions. Uh, we all do emotion work in our interacting with people, uh, but certain people do it uh, professionally as part of their job, right? A doctor does a certain amount of emotion work, right? A doctor does a certain amount of making you feel better about a situation. A waiter does a certain amount of emotion work. A waiter uh, treats you politely, typically no matter what, even if you're being a jerk to them, that's part of being a waiter. A sex worker, uh, people who are sometimes called prostitutes, they also do a degree of emotion work, right? They pretend that the person that they're having sex with is somehow desirable. But the reality of the matter is that the given sex worker might be utterly bored with everything that the person is doing. That is an intense example of emotion work. And with that, we'll finish our lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know.